apologize. We had a few technical difficulties. It looks like we are live now. We are continuing our book, How Zinky by Sam Campbell. Individuality with feathers and fur and skin on it. Mornings always were attended by the wildest scenes at our orphanage. All were hungry at once, all demanding attention. Bobette would be bleeding, rack and ruin crying incessantly, seeming never to stop long enough to breathe. Sausage would be squeaking and inky grunting. The effect was something like that of a machine shot badly in need of oil. And the louder they yelled, the more furiously we rushed about trying to meet their demands. It is hard to believe that five such tiny things could keep three full-grown men so busy. But they could, and they did. There was never a dull moment, neither was there a day without its lesson for us. I suppose the most startling discovery a student of nature makes is that there are never two things created alike. In all this great world about us and all the universe which has no limit, no two things are alike. Not even two grains of sand are exactly the same. Not two blades of grass, not two trees, not two animals, and above all, not two human beings. We began to see this demonstrated anew in our young animal friends, Rack and Ruin. Rack and Ruin were similar, but they were not the same. Even as babies, we could see the differences in their behavior. And so were Inky, Sausage, and Bobette strictly individual. Nothing just like them had ever lived before. Nothing ever would again. It was interesting to see how this individuality asserted itself. Certainly, from the first, our little charges wanted to be just themselves and nothing else. They insisted upon it, and even if we had wanted to change them, we couldn't have done so. They didn't cry alike, they didn't eat alike, they didn't bite alike. Though, let it be understood, they did plenty of all these things. Each had a mind of his own, instincts of his own, a way of his own. Moreover, each wanted his own way. As we studied them, we came to realize how much trouble we human beings would save ourselves if we would learn this one lesson those simple little tykes knew instinctively. For we may know that each one of us is new in nature. His talents are new, his energies new, his opportunities new. And furthermore, that the full measure of his power is found only in using his individuality in service to the world. Some may think it too good to be true, yet it is true. For we see here the proved pattern of creation. Certainly under this knowledge, no one ever could have an inferiority complex. Inky never felt inferior. He stepped right out into the world to use his talents the creator had given him. Inky didn't wonder if some other porcupine were more talented than he. He didn't think of that at all. He just lived his best. Whether he ever thought of it that way or not, he knew instinctively that he was individually equal to any problem and was master of his own destiny. Nor could a human being ever question his own importance, that there was a place for him in the world, that he could succeed and be happy so long as he himself realized that he was distinctly original and that his whole life was within himself. He would just live his best, as Inky does, and his best would be good enough. Now, what we are saying does not imply that each animal is a new species. Inky was a porcupine. There are millions of porcupines, yet there is only one Inky. Rack and Ruin are raccoons. Sausage is a woodchuck, Bobette a deer. They have the ways and appearances of their fellow creatures. Live in like manner, but they are not identical. Thus, as we study living things, plants, animals, and human beings, we find in each one characteristics in which it resembles its kind, but also character which makes it original and individual. Porcupines sometimes seem to be a joke nature has played. These remarkable quills of theirs, they offer a strange method of defense. Porkies say to the world, we don't want to hurt anyone, but you had better let us alone. They are born with quills and baby spines being about the size of needles and just as sharp. As porcupines grow older, the quills become coarser and more numerous. At one time, the story was widely believed that a porcupine shoots or throws his quills at his enemy. That has been proved untrue. I told the story to Inky, and he walked away in high disgust. But no animal has better protection from the common dangers of the woods than the porcupine. It is often said that the spines are barbed like fish hooks, but that description does not begin to tell the story. It isn't just one barb, but a thousand or more on a single quill, and so arranged that after the quill has entered the flesh, these barbs keep the quill from being easily withdrawn. We never felt worried about Inky when he began wandering about the forest. Most animals know enough to let porcupines alone, and those who don't have a severe lesson to learn. Those quills are fierce weapons, and there are plenty of them, too. It is estimated by good authorities that a large-sized porcupine will have as many as 36,000 quills, 
covering every bit of the body except the legs, underparts, and regions of the nose. What a pincushion! No wonder Inky has inherited such provoking independence. He and his kind have perfect confidence in their defense. They have not bothered to develop an ability to move fast, be clever, or hide well, or to depend on biting in combat. Yet they have fine teeth. When Inky first came to us, he already had four front teeth, two uppers and two lowers, amber in color and sharp as razors. It was necessary to feed him through the side of his mouth, as his teeth would cut the rubber nipples as fast as they were presented to him. We had much experience with those teeth. They are designed for taking the bark from trees, so Inky would sometimes take, take the bark off of us, too. A porcupine does not eat meat, yet he never really lacks food. In summer, green plants and green leaves make up much of his diet. In the winter, bark, winter buds, and twigs interest him the most. He is especially fond of salt, a fact which makes him rather unpopular with farmers and woodsmen when he chews the sweat-soaked handles of their axes, pitchforks, etc. The severe northern winters hold no terrors for porcupines. Although they do not hibernate, they seem to be immune to the cold. On days when the temperature would be many degrees below zero, porcupines have been observed far out on the ends of limbs, not even seeking shelter. They are good-humored creatures and are quite playful. Yes, Inky has a good ancestry. His people didn't come over on the Mayflower, but they got into history many times just the same. The earliest records of pioneers show that porcupines attracted their attention, and wherever explorers went from Central America almost to the Arctic Circle, porcupines were there to greet them. Rack and ruin come from interesting lineage, too. Raccoons like southern climates best, though they refuse to be limited and have been found as far north as the Hudson Bay region. They are closely related to bears and possibly proud of the fact, for the bear is king of the woods. Rack and ruin certainly could tear up a room in bear fashion, and proved this on several occasions. The little gray faces of raccoons, for seemingly no reason at all, have a single black stripe across the eyes. They look like masked bandits, and they sometimes act like them, too. It may be that they had one stripe left over from those that ringed their tails and didn't know where else to put it. A hollow tree is the raccoon's favorite home. It didn't take Rack and Ruin long to find one for themselves as soon as they had outgrown their babyhood, though we have been searching ever since and have not located their apartment. No creature has ever fitted more perfectly into the solitude of nature than has the raccoon. They make no more noise than moonbeams, Bobby once said. The raccoon's little feet are super sensitive. These animals literally feel their way about at night. If they have one dominant characteristic, it is curiosity. They run their little feet into every corner and crack, examining through sense of touch the things they find. Bobby was the victim of this curiosity one night during his sleep. He was sleeping with his mouth open and snoring. Ruin probably couldn't understand what was causing all the racket, for Bobby was awakened rather abruptly to find a raccoon foot in his mouth, reaching for his tonsils. Sometimes, this little curiosity habit of raccoons is used to their detriment. Trappers place steel traps in hollow logs or hollow trees, under brush, or in holes in the ground. The unsuspecting raccoon comes feeling his way along, reaches innocently into the hidden trap, and finds himself suddenly the, in the painful grip of merciless steel jaws. Raccoons are very happy and sociable creatures. Snooty old Inky and his kind live pretty much to themselves and are generally seen singly. Not so with raccoons. One night there were 19 of them on our porch at one time. It is certainly no problem to know what to feed raccoons. Their interest is more in volume than in variety. They have preferences, but will eat almost anything, and lots of it. Frogs, fish, flesh, fowls, insects, reptiles, corn, fruit, grain, vegetables, and unfortunately, farmer's chickens are on their menu. Sweet, sweets of any sort are in high favor. Rack and Ruin preferred cooked oatmeal sweetened with honey to all other food. Sausage and her kind do not rate so highly with the human race. They have a habit of eating the food we raise for ourselves, and that is a serious offense. At least people think it is. Judge Norton had a peculiar grudge against Little Sausage. Although he tried to conceal the fact, we certainly learned that he fancied... Oh, we learned that he fancied he did not like woodchucks. During his boyhood in Indiana, these little rodents had battled with him for the possession of his garden. Those varmints are just pests, said the judge, and he presented a much greater hatred for them than he really felt. One day, when Sausage was partly grown... That Bobby beckoned to me to come to him. He pointed to the judge sitting on an old log, holding sausage in his arms, and talking baby talk to her. I guess she had been forgiven for what her ancestors had done. One could love the woodchuck for its courage, even if for nothing else. 
While shy when human beings are around, woodchucks seem to have no fear of other creatures. They will fight animals many times their size. I have seen one attack a police dog. They are fast-moving, powerful, and have marvelously strong jaws and sharp teeth. Their favorite dwelling place is a hole in the ground which they dig for themselves, though space under a building is all right too. They are hibernators and work harder at it than any other creature of the north. As early as October, they enter this peculiar sleep. It is their way of going south for the winter. They do not arouse from their stupor until warm weather has returned in the spring. During that long period, they do not awaken even to eat. Sausage was so fat she could roll faster than she could walk when it came time for winter sleep. That fat would be used up by her body as food during the months to come. Had Babette been inclined toward pride, she would have had plenty of reason to boast about her family. Throughout history, the deer family has been famous for beauty. Hunting the stag was always the sport of kings, though the kings were not always such good sports. But the sight of a great old buck along the shore of a wilderness lake probably will always remain the most appealing scene in nature. Only the male deer has antlers, and he seems quite proud of them. At least he is always trying to improve them. He grows a new pair every year, shedding the old ones, and they become larger and more beautiful each season. The story that one can tell the age of a buck by the number of points on his antlers is untrue, however. For the first two years, only this is possible. The first year, the buck grows finger-like horns. They are called spike horns. The next year, the antlers will have two points or four horns. But after that, it is uncertain how many points will develop. Babette wore a red-brown coat speckled with light-colored spots when she came to us. That is what the best-dressed fawns wear. <clears throat> the spots generally disappear in the autumn, though we have known of the little fellows retaining them through the next spring. The winter coat is dark gray, blending nicely with winter landscapes. But that baby coat of theirs is a masterpiece of protective coloration. In baby days, especially during the first week of life, the fawn spends most of his time curled up on the forest floor. That permits the mother to forage for food, since a fawn in this position is almost impossible to see. There is reason to believe, too, that at that age fawns have no odor that dogs or wolves can detect. Woodsmen have seen these predatory animals pass within a few feet of fawns and never know of their presence. Apparently at that age, the entire safety of the little fellows is entrusted to their protective coloration and their absence of odor. Fawns have no strength or tendency to run. Foresters often find them in quiet hidden spots and walk right up to them. Still, they will not move. Unfortunately, sometimes those finding fawns in this way believe they have been deserted by their mothers and take them in. That should not be done unless it is known for sure that something has happened to the mother, for otherwise she will return. It is best by far for both doe and fawn that they be left together. While we reared Babette successfully, we always realized she would have been better off with her mother, had her mother been spared her. The main defense of deer is in flight. No one knows just how fast they can run, but we have timed them on a roadway at 35 miles an hour. When Babette took a notion to do so, she could disappear so quickly it would seem the ground had swallowed her up. But deer will fight when cornered and fight very effectively. They strike forward with their front feet. In that way, they have been known to kill wolves and other creatures attacking them. However, there are many creatures in the forest more powerful and more clever than they, and their life is a severe one. Their food is plant life generally, though there are very definite records of certain ones eating fish. Deer love the company of their own kind. While Inky was satisfied to climb a tree by himself and make no effort to find other porcupines, Babette was more socially inclined. Very soon she had made friends among her wild relatives of the forest. They would come to see her within sight of our cabin, but no closer. Some way she knew when they were there and would go to them, be with them a while, but then return home. There is that individuality again. She was one of them, yet still an individual, still herself. Inky sat before the fireplace one night, looking most wise and self-reliant. At the time, he was less than four months old, yet he had full possession of his selfhood. He was the very picture of individuality and unoffending independence. I laughed aloud as a fanciful thought came to me. Inky should be a lecturer, helping the human race where faith is needed so badly. How grand if he could speak before schools, give young people renewed confidence in themselves. In imagination, I pictured him on the platform in a great auditorium. Of course, he would wear important appearing eyeglasses, and as certainly he would look over the top of them at his audience. He would stand there in perfect composure until everyone had quieted down, and then begin as if they had all eternity for his talk. Young folks, he would say, what I have to say I can say in mighty few words. 
but I'm going to tell you something some folks are afraid to tell you just because it isn't the style to say such things. But I don't care about style and I'm probably afraid and I'm not afraid of anybody. And with this, he would probably raise his quills until he looked like a prickly pear and glare defiantly over his glasses to see if anyone challenged him. You fellows are trying to live unnaturally. And that's not natural. I mean, it isn't possible. You're just kidding yourselves. You're forgetting how to be yourselves and are always trying to be someone else. Now the creator had just made one plan for everything he made. The same one made you as made us porcupines. He did a little better on us than he did on you, but that doesn't make any difference. His plan was to make everyone different so that they wouldn't get in each other's way. Then he wanted each one to be complete and original, so he gave each one some special ability, some talent. He says then, go on and be yourselves, all of you. Have faith in what makes you different from the rest, for that is you. Don't go reaching for someone, what someone else has or trying to be like him. I'm giving each one of you a job to do, a place to fill, but if you just be yourselves, you'll know what it is. But what have you folks always been a-doing? Here, no doubt, Inky would fold his paws behind his back, pace back and forth while he thought it out. Let me tell you, you've been living according to styles and plans someone else thinks up, everyone trying to be like the style, and you haven't been natural. Suppose us porcupines would get together and decide that we should all be alike, and then go goose-stepping around thinking we were smart. Who would do our work in the woods? Life isn't built that way, folks. You have to be yourselves. The Creator knew what he was doing, and he doesn't make mistakes. No one of you is a mistake. When you get home tonight, sit down in some quiet place and just ask yourself, what can I do better than anything, anything else? And when you answer that honestly, make up your mind to do it. Nobody else can do it as well as you. And for all the love of a salt lick, don't do something else just be, to be like someone you're jealous of. Be yourself. Every animal in the woods knows that much. Be yourself. That's the way to live, and it's the only way. That's a pretty long speech for Inky, but I'll wager before he left the platform, he would say, and sometime, chew the bark off a pine tree. It'll do you good. Well, Inky can't go out and give lectures, but if he could, what he would say would be true, for he would speak out of his own naturalness. Happiness in this world does lie in following nature's pattern. That is, for each one to be the finest and purest individual he can be. Judge Norton expressed it well one night with another verse of his song. When nature makes each one of us, she throws away the mold. She never makes two things alike, at least so I've been told. So don't be like some other guy. It can't be done, you see. Just try the very best you can to be the one you be. That is chapter three of our book. I think we have time maybe for one more. Chapter 4. Patience is nature's password. You get nowhere without it. It was fascinating to watch the day-by-day -day change in our five little fur-covered orphans as they grew through their babyhood and dragged us with them, and it was just as fascinating, fascinating to see how this experience affected Bobby. Bobby had lived most of his life in a great city. He attended schools that accommodated thousands of students, big buildings, crowded sidewalks, and tangled traffic he had known ever since he was said of him, it's a boy. The city was in his blood. Its haste, hurry, impetus, and impatience were a habit with him. Hence, when he first came to the sanctuary, impatience was stamped over his brow and under it too. He wanted everything done with a whoop and a holler, a gush and a rush. Patience, he thought, meant a doctor's customers. Bobby tried to lead nature around by the nose, and it took him some time to learn that nature won't be led. That attitude of impatience brought him a quick but not final lesson when he first came north. He was up in the bow of a small boat as it was coming up to the pier. The boat had lost much of its momentum and wasn't arriving as fast as Bobby's impatience thought it should. So he jumped from the boat to the pier, or perhaps it is better to say, he jumped from the boat toward the pier. For one doesn't really jump from a small boat. He merely kicks the boat backward and stays where the boat used to be. That's what Bobby did. He made his leap and disappeared under the surface of the water. It was a drenched, cold, and wiser boy who came up sputtering and climbing out, dripping out onto the pier. The laughter of his companions did not console him very much. Nature never hurries. She moves steadily, always arrives on time, finishes things on schedule, but she never hurries. Those who live with nature, woodsmen, lumberjacks, rangers, guides, learn to know patience. 
and to synchronize themselves with nature's pace. Haste just doesn't fit in the forest, and in truth, it doesn't fit anywhere. Judge Norton had a song for this too. Oh, there was a little feller, and he thought he was so smart, he always tried to get some place before he'd even start. Yes, he talked when he was sleeping, and when he walked he ran. His story now is ended, and he's right where he began. But Bobby learned patience, as he, and he learned it well. Much credit for this accomplishment goes to those five little orphans, but much goes to Bobby too. Among his many virtues was the fact that he had no mercy on errors or weaknesses he found within himself. If he discovered something in his character that needed correction, he didn't hide it behind a sense of pride and indifference, as some do, but demanded of himself that it be changed. So it was when he became fully awake to the fact that he had a habit of impatience. That must be corrected. He would not have it otherwise. He saw in the presence of the five orphans an opportunity to work out his problem with himself. Explaining his purpose first, he asked that he be given charge of feeding and caring for the little ones. His request was granted, and thereafter neither Judge Norton nor I took a major part in this work. Often we would slip up to the little cabin to peek through the window to watch Bobby as his process of, in his process of self-discipline. Sometimes it seemed he had attempted too much. Especially did this seem true at mealtime, and mealtime at the orphanage was every three hours. Bobby became quite the expert at the routine. He needed to be, for it was a task in those early days when all food was administered by means of a baby's bottle and a rubber ear syringe. First, he would prepare a large pan of milk diluted properly and warmed. Next, he would fill the bottle for Bobette and the syringe which was used for the others. Then he would draw one long deep breath and into the little cabin as if he were headed for some inescapable fate. Sometimes it seemed he was. What a hullabaloo would break loose when he stepped through that doorway. Each one of the five wanted to be fed first, and each one kept informing the world about it in screams and screeches. Bobby would make his way across the room with difficulties aplenty. A raccoon always just where he wanted to step, a porcupine biting his ankle, a deer nudging him impatiently with her nose, and a woodchuck trying to climb up his pants leg. Bobby would seat himself, that is, unless Sausage got in the chair first, and she generally did. In that case, Bobby would push her and implore her to get out of the way, usually to no avail. When finally seated, he would hold the bottle out to Bobette and insert the syringe into one of four other mouths which were gaping at him. Thereupon, two voices would be silenced, except for sounds like a cow walking through deep mud, while, other, while the three others, offended and self-righteous, would emit shrieks of ear-splitting quality and roof-raising volume. One day, we looked in on Bobby when this dinner-time riot reached a calamitous proportion. Bobette was going after the bottle as if she meant to swallow it whole. Her usual, unusual vigor probably was due to the fact that sausage was out on Bobby's arm, trying desperately to get the bottle herself. Rack got first chance at the ear syringe, as he generally did, and his enthusiasm looked and sounded like Bobette's. But Ruin, feeling a bit neglected, had climbed up Bobby's shirt and was nibbling on his nose. Nothing he could do about it, because both hands were busy. He might have jerked his head away, except that Inky had climbed onto his shoulder and was chewing persistently on his ear. Poor Bobby, what a picture of fatherly martyrdom he presented. Inky, Sausage, ah, Ruin, let a fellow alone, will you, he pleaded. There was no response, except that Inky did not did turn to the other ear and scratch the back of Bobby's neck while making the change. No doubt at that moment there was a wee small voice down deep in Bobby suggesting he start a revolution. But he was learning patience and learning it fast. Get the picture there for you. Just then, Bobette let out a heartbreaking bleat and rack a cry of disappointment. The milk in the bottle and syringe had given out. As Bobby started to refill them, he found the milk in the pan was cold. Thereupon, he had to put out all the orphans and place the milk on the stove. All noise made prior to that moment was deep silence compared to with what now broke loose. From the screams, one would think a lumberjack with hobnail boots was standing on each one of five tails. The little fellows thought the meal was ended. They followed at Bobby's heels, crying with all their lung strength, pulling at his trousers, climbing up and falling down. He talked to them, calling each one by name, pleading with them, but he might as well have talked to a tornado. They wanted food right then and plenty of it. Explanations did nothing for their stomachs. During all this, Bobby had a great fear that he would step on one of the little orphans. He said once that he did not take one wholesome full-length step in weeks. Every time he put his foot forward, he would remain balanced for a few seconds until he was sure he had really reached the ground. That particular day, Bobby had so much trouble keeping the little fellows from under his feet. He let the milk stay on the stove over long, and it was too hot to use. 
That resulted in another delay, which couldn't be explained to the one so vitally concerned, and the outcries reached a new and more annoying crescendo. After what seemed an age to the orphans and an ordeal to Bobby, the milk was right, the utensils refilled, and feeding was going forward once more. Inky climbed up to resume his ear chewing, Ruin got a chance at the ear syringe, much to Rack's discomfort, and Sausage, for some reason, had retreated into a box. Suddenly, she discovered what was going on and came on the run to Bobby, tipped over Rack, and pushed Ruin away from her dinner. Ruin, much grieved, started a battle, and in doing so, stepped on the rim of the milk pan, which had been placed conveniently at hand on the floor and tipped it over. Then a fresh riot began. The whole dinner had to be delayed until Bobby obtained more milk, diluted it, warmed it, filled the utensils, and returned. And the roof and walls vibrated with violently voiced objections. Not all dinners at the orphanage brought that much trouble, but each had its own peculiar problem, and throughout all, Bobby never wavered. But a day came which tried Bobby's newly developed patience to the limit. During the midday hours at that particular day, he had taken the animals out into the sunshine. For a long time, he dashed this way and that to retrieve one or another of them from some threatening circumstances. Then, somewhat exhausted, he returned them to their cabin, shut the door all too carelessly, and went away for a little rest and relaxation. When he returned an hour later, he found the door had blown open and the orphans had disappeared. This, of course, was a job for everyone, and Judge Norton and I joined Bobby in an anxious search. We called and called the names of our pets while weaving our way through underbrush and trees, looking in every nook and corner. But for a long time, not one of the animals did we find. After an hour of frantic search, Bobby chanced to pass the door of the little cabin, and there stood Sausage looking out at him, as if asking what all the rumpus was about. She had returned of her own volition, and seemed somewhat surprised and a little bit offended that her ability to take care of herself had been questioned. Sausage, you little scamp, Bobby scolded. Where have you been? Where are Rack and Ruin? If she, if she understood him, Sausage turned and went into the cabin. Following her, Bobby found Rack and Ruin in their nest, acting as if nothing had happened. But Inky and Bobette were still at large, very much at large. We searched and called and called and searched until we were all at the point of despair. At several places we found Bobette's tiny track, but among leaves and pine needles it disappeared without giving us any real clue. We had begun to feel that she had taken to the woods and was already hopelessly in the land of predators when Bobby suddenly grabbed my arm. Do you see what I see, he asked. Yes, I saw what he saw, and we called the judge so that he might see it too. There, within thirty feet of us, curled up in a little depression under some little balsam trees, lay Bobette, her big eyes watching us interestedly as if she were wondering how long we would be so stupid. We had passed that place a dozen times during our search. No doubt she was there all the while, but her protective coloring was so effective we had not noticed her. Bobby said one of her ears had moved and his attention was drawn by that action, otherwise he would not have found her when he did. She was given a severe lecture, to which she paid not the slightest attention, and returned to the orphanage. Now only Inky remained to be found. Once more we circled through the woods, calling for our porcupine and looking up every tree. It was late and we were getting tired, but Bobby's newfound patience was bearing up well. There was no lack of enthusiasm and hope in his voice as he kept calling, Inky, Inky. And finally the answer came. From the top of a tree, which we had passed numerous times, Inky's voice responded in friendly grunts. But he didn't come down, not immediately. Of a sudden he realized that he was master of the situation. All of his infinite impishness came to the surface. No one could doubt that he was deliberately taunting us and having a wonderful time at our expense. The tree was too small for us to climb, so we had to coax him to come to us. He would answer our pleading in his most affectionate tones, but not make a move in our direction. Lying flat on a branch, he reached his front feet toward us, and then with a smart twist of his head and flick of his tail, he climbed higher in the tree. Inky, Inky, come on down, Bobby pleaded. All is forgiven, come on down. Inky grunted and climbed still higher. Ah, Inky, Bobby added pathos to his voice. You remember me, how I fed you milk and even put honey in it? Come on down. Inky went to the topmost branch and looked higher for more worlds to conquer. He seemed to like our pleading, however, and when we tired we were si and were silent for a few moments, we suddenly discovered that he had descended to within about twelve feet of the ground. Attaboy, Inky, old pal, old pal, old pal, we cried in chorus. We knew you would come to us, attaboy. And Inky promptly climbed to the top again. There were other things to be done, so Judge Norton and I left persistent and patient Bobby at Inky's tree. We could hear Bobby alternately using please, endearing terms, and threats on the obstinate porcupine to no avail. Inky never felt more important in all his life. The whole world was at his feet, and he was not going to surrender so long as there was any acknowledgement of his sovereignty. 
After a time, Bobby tired and in helplessness sat at the foot of the tree, leaning against it. He dozed off for a few moments, but was awakened suddenly by a familiar sensation. Inky was perched on his shoulder, chewing on his ear. Inky was then restored to the orphanage without punishment. What would you do to punish a porcupine? It is no use to scold him, for he won't listen. Try to spank him, and the old saying becomes emphatically true, this hurts me more than it does you. So Bobby gave him a cookie, at the same time saying something about returning good for evil or praying for those who despitefully use you. Inky was so impressed he didn't do it again, that day. But this experience had been more than a test of patience. It marked a turning point in the lives of the orphans. A door had been opened to them, and they had had their first look at the great world about them. The little cabin in which they had spent their babyhood could never completely contain them again. They were ready for the next stage of their growth, ready for greater liberty, and thereafter the cabin door was left open so they could come and go as they pleased. Bobby looked upon this development with just a tinge of sadness. His long period of responsibility and intense care was ended. The animals were learning to feed themselves and taking more and more natural food. They did not need him to administer to them constantly as in weeks now past. I guess I feel the same way some parents do when their children go away, he said one day. I just don't like to have these little fellows not need me anymore. But they do need you, Bobby, I assured him. You are doing as much for them when you give them liberty as when you give them milk. You will get new joy out of watching them grow and learn. Parents always must learn this. The animals still have much to give you, and you have much to give them. It is impossible to measure how much they already have given me, Bobby said quietly. That evening, as darkness was just coming on, and sacred silence ruled heaven and earth, I found Bobby seated on a log, watching the fading hues of the western sky. I have watched a sunset through, he said with obvious satisfaction. For over an hour I have been here watching everything change in a wonderful display of beauty. Do you know I have never done that before? I never had the patience until now. I would look at a sunset, take a glance at it, but I wouldn't look long, for something inside me would make me want to go somewhere and do something else. So this is a part of life I had missed, the beauty of a sunset. Do you see what those little animals have done for me? I did. I had long seen it, and since the moment was favorable to serious thought, I told Bobby how important I believe is the attainment of patience. Its presence enriches all other virtues. Its absence deepens vice. Some seem to take pride in impatience, as if it indicated a certain superior energy or intelligence in them. But impatience is always a weakness, not a strength. Many crimes of men and nations arrive from impatience. We all feel instinctively the coming of great good and the accomplishment in our lives. No doubt the instinct is true, and in the way of natural unfoldment, the goodness will come. But impatience leads to grabbing things, taking them from others. It leads to crime and injustice. Patience is not slowness, nor is it tolerance of slowness. It is simply living contentedly within the laws of life. And patience is power. It is peace. It is culture. That night, Bobby composed a verse to Judge's song, and it wasn't bad. Yes, I'm the little feller that the judge once sang about. I surely was impatient, but at last I found it out. Now I sit and watch a sunset, and I want it understood. I'm as patient as they make them, and oh boy, but it feels good. Here's to all of you, as we all learn patience together during this time. That's the end of chapter four. Join us tomorrow for chapter five, Home, There's No Place Like It As Every Creature Knows.